Good morning, everyone. My name is Tara Lynn Gray, Chief Executive Officer of the Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce and Chamber Foundation, where we engage, educate, and empower our Black-owned business community. I want to thank you for joining us today for this webinar that is backed by popular demand. Cannabis, is it an opportunity for economic development in communities of color. We have some ideas about that, and we are joined by some very special guests today who have a lot of knowledge in this area. In today's session, we are going to hear from Christine De La Rosa, CEO and national co-founder at the People's Dispensary. Joined by Christine are Cesar Casamayor and Gede Maza from the People's Dispensary here in Fresno. And before we get started, I want to remind you that all participant microphones have been muted. The um, Today's webinar will be recorded and it will be available for viewing on our social media channels. Now I'd like to introduce each of our guests. Christine De La Rosa is CEO and national co-founder, as I mentioned earlier, and she spent 20 years as a systems and database architect in tech before coming to cannabis. She is a social entrepreneur who has spent most of her adult life building businesses that creatively engage and employ the local communities that surround them. A history in technology, business consulting, and entrepreneurship were part of the trajectory that led to co-owning successful cannabis businesses in both California and Oregon. She is a well-respected business leader, advocate, and activist. She's passionate about the industry that saved her life. And at the top of her tech career, she almost died from complications of undiagnosed lupus. So in 2015, she found cannabis as an alternative medicine to treat her condition, and she was no longer bound to 11 pills a day or monthly infusions. As a result, she was inspired by her experience to open Benefit Health Collective in 2016, along with her co-founders to help those who most need access to cannabis. Together, they continued to grow their multi- state dispensary footprint and build a fiercely sought after national social equity model and enterprise known as the people's dispensary welcome today christine joined by um christine are cesar casamayor and gade maza who are co-founders of the people's dispensary in fresno a prospective cannabis dispensary aimed at helping underserved communities they recognize fresno's emerging legal cannabis industry as a local and regional economic development tool for the city valley and our communities who have taken the collateral damage hit that has been inflicted by the failed war on drugs campaign they advocate for social equity fighting for fresno's measure a cannabis business tax to ensure that revenue from cannabis businesses benefits marginalized communities they also advocate for national policies such as the Safe Banking Act of 2019 in Congress through the NCIA, representing the People's Dispensary. Wow, that's a lot. And we are glad to have you here with us today. I can't no. hear you. All right, there we go. Got sound. Today You're on mute today for some reason. Can you hear me, Miss Tara? I can hear you, Cesar. I cannot hear good day. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Christine. 
okay, but you can't see me. <laughs> but I can't see you. <laughs> we got you incognito today. <laughs> so, um, I think, uh, Cesar, maybe, or Christine, why don't you guys go, one of you go ahead and start the uh, presentation until we're able to get good days. Um, sure. Um, audio. Good day. I can tell you're nodding your head, so you can hear us, but for some reason we can't hear you. Um, you want to make sure that your mute is not on? Okay. Okay. So, Christine or Cesar, you want to go ahead and begin the presentation? Yes, and I hope that we can resolve um, the technical difficulty for audio for today. But I would like to first just say thank you for the opportunity to speak to your brothers and sisters today about something that's very, very critical and important in our communities because for many, 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 many years, generations, um, a lot of the African American community has been disenfranchised, dismissed from access to economic development and economic mobility and generational wealth. So today's topic of the People's Dispensary, a platform for economic development in communities of color is what we're gonna be focusing on. And we're really going to hopefully have a good dialogue with, with, with our brothers and sisters who's in the audience to make sure that we are um, explaining ourselves correctly, respectfully, and having um, inclusion in about what should be done best in regards of making sure that there is economic opportunities, but more importantly, inclusion of our communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs. So with that being said, um, we can go to the next slide, please. As part of our mission, we just wanna say that we believe in the power of cannabis to help transform communities who've been harmed by its historical criminalization. This is very, very um, important to us because this is the foundation of why we do what we do as a social enterprise business. Um, Christine, would you like to add anything to, to the statement? Nope, I think you got it pretty much covered. That's what we're doing. <laughs> yep, that's what we've been doing, that's right. So, um, next slide. So before we get into the, to the big um, uh, meat of, of, of this presentation, I wanna say a little bit about myself. So my name again is Cesar Casamayor. Um, I've been impacted by the war on drugs through the Rockefeller Drug Laws in New York City. Um, and I've been here in Fresno since 2006. I have 10 years experience working in the community as a community organizer um, with organizing with homeless youth, advocating for homeless youth rights, advocating for immigrant rights, advocating for youth empowerment and engaging youth who've been um, criminalized and impacted by the war on drugs. And last thing I'd like to say is that the reason why I got into this industry was to ensure respectful and meaningful approaches and practices to do right for impacted communities Correct. through this words that they use of social equity and that needs to i believe needs to be redefined but that's the reason why we got into this industry to make sure that brothers and sisters who come from communities impacted by war on drugs have a stake and entrance into this industry and so I would like to pass it out to, to Gede that has um, fixed his audio and he can introduce himself better than I can. Absolutely. Hey, thank you all. So I've connected via my phone. So yeah, so my name is Gede Maza um, and my entry point into the industry comes specifically from the community mental health world. Um, as, a, as a therapist currently um, and historically, I've worked alongside um, individuals and families and communities um, who historically have been, have had like their social, emotional, and economic well-being devastated by the war on drugs, and very specifically, overcriminalization. Um, and and within that, having our loved ones locked up for minor offenses. So for me, the cannabis dollar is the start of undoing the war on drugs, the harm that it's done, and really creating and recreating a future within the industry for our folks. That's right. Can we go to the next slide, please? So before we hop into this clip, which will be brief, um, I want to preface it with 
the understanding that we as the people's dispensary know um and and believe that this is going to be a 40 dollar 40 billion dollar i apologize industry by 2021 and it'll create at least 400,000 jobs by 2022 um currently as it stands 33 plus states have passed legalization um laws around cannabis in some shape or fashion states and city governments have followed suit um, on a level and are realizing that are well regulated and um oh, i'm sorry a well-regulated cannabis industry um, which is centered in creating a pathway for the legacy market or for what most folks may know as the black market or underground market um, can per not only protect community but improve individual economic life so Craig, let's let's run that clip. Great. So um, thank you, Craig, for, for playing that. I would like to really highlight a couple of things, and I would like to defer to Christine, who was able to put the video together for us. But the most important things that I, that I think for, for us here locally in Fresno is that we should be demanding better from our city council and our mayor to make sure that we don't make the mistakes of other cities. Um, and so with that being said, I would like to um, defer the, the following um, comments about this, this video and I'll get a better understanding of why we did this video from Christine, our, our intelligent CEO. Christine, can you please um, talk a little bit about the video we just seen? Sure, so, you know, when we, the People's Dispensary actually started in the traditional market or the informal market um, in Oakland. And so one of the things that we saw pretty clearly early on was um, that there was really no place for legalized markets to actually exist in harmony with communities unless they really understood the harm that had been done um, to these communities of colors of which we all belong to. And so when we started to do a lot of our research about what our social equity platform would be, what our um, tenants of our company would be, we started to look at the statistics. And um, the statistics are very clear that the cannabis industry or the marijuana industry was used to incarcerate black and brown men, black and brown people, with black men being the largest group of people that were incarcerated for cannabis offenses. And we're not talking like, you know, metric tons, we're talking small amounts of cannabis. And, and some people are still in jail for that today. So when there was talk at the beginning about like, well, you know, when cannabis was like, oh, we have to do social equity, because rem remember, Colorado, Nevada, Washington and Oregon all went recreational and not a single one of them thought what that meant for the people that were currently incarcerated in their states. They just opened it up and say, hey, let's do this. Let's get this legal while people were still rotting in jail. So we found about 80% of the incarceration um, was black and brown folks. And so we felt that it was really within, in order for there, there to be equity, that 80% of the licenses in the US should go to black and brown people that were affected by the war on drugs. And so when we said that back in 2017, 2018, people thought we were crazy. <laughs> they were like, you want us to give 80% of the licensing in the US to black and brown people? And I said, and my team said, and Gadan Sasad said, well, you incarcerated us at that, at that rate. So that's why we put this together so people could understand 
that we're not actually, this is not something that the, the governments or the legalized cannabis industry are giving to us. We've paid for this with our lives, with our blood, with our sweat, with our tears, with our communities. And so the idea that anybody would think that it's ridiculous to give 80% of the people who suffered for this legalized industry will show you the systematic racism that currently exists in the cannabis legal market. And that's why we did that. Was that good enough, Cesar? That's perfect. Can I break it down for you? Okay, cool. Broke it down. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go to the next slide. We can keep it moving. And, and just to let y'all brothers and sisters know, we will be getting into um, conversations and questions. Craig, if you want to um, go ahead. So I think um, I have a question, I think, um, that I'd like to ask right now. Um, in your opinion, Gade, what are some of the ways that um, communities in Fresno can cash in on this opportunity before others? Can you repeat that again, Ms. Ms. Tara? So Gade, can yeah. You... So I, I want to know what are some of the ways that communities in Fresno can cash in on this opportunity, this opportunity to have cannabis-based businesses take advantage of the multi-billion dollar market that you all talked about um, just a moment ago. Um, what are some of the ways that communities in Fresno's neighborhoods or specific communities can cash in on this opportunity before others? Right. Well, G'day, you got it? Okay, I guess he's having difficulties. I'll take the question. So I think this is a great opportunity. Um, around the nation, we're seeing a lot of, of, of the need and the cry for economic development for communities, right? Especially uh, when we talk about reparations, all the wrongs that have been done specifically to African-American communities here and the Aboriginal uh, communities here in, in our country. And so we're looking at a multifaceted, I think we're going to get more into this in the next slide, but I would just say there are so many different avenues to get into this industry that it is important that we don't just look at it from a moral perspective, but we look at it from a from a perspective of it's here. And so how are our, our communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs, that are come from low income, how are we going to benefit? So some of those things would be something like, for example, um, we see that there is a big tech movement here in our city of Fresno. So creating apps is one way to get into the industry. Security is another way to get into the industry from not just dealing with the flower and, and, and that side of the business, but there's others, right? For example, delivery is another. So there's many different ways. Construction is another one. Um, so there's many different ways to get into the industry, but at the same time, too, we also have to be mindful that it's only going to happen if we advocate, if we push for the, the city and the city council to do right. So we can have the greatest ideas, right? But we have to continue to show that we are capable of being entrepreneurs, business owners, so the money can circulate in our communities. But these are just some small examples and we're gonna get into something of more in depth about different entry on pathways into the industry. Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. 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 Tara. You're welcome. Um, G'day, did you have something you wanted to add to that before we hit to the next slide? No, I, you know, I think, and I apologize y'all for this audio here, uh, no, I think Cesar hit the points, and I, I think I, I, I'd like to make it very clear that, you know, touching the plant itself, cannabis is, is not the only option to enter the market. Um, and, and with that being said, I'd like to hop into the emerging businesses um, opportunities within cannabis slide. So, Christine, did you have anything before I hopped in? No, go right ahead. Y'all got it covered. Perfect. Thank you. So, we come with the understanding that cannabis, as it continues to become legal is big business, right? And, and Cesar this and Cesar said this, and I'm going to emphasize this. Um, you don't have to touch the plant, nor do you have to recreate the wheel in terms of entering the market itself. Um, we are the, the legacy and under, underground market 
I think some of the statistics and Cesar and, and Christine helped me out as well, um, show that at least in California, the legacy market itself currently is at about $8 billion. Um, whereas California as a legal industry um, is somewhere in the one to $2 billion range. So, you know, the numbers show that if we can center our folks um, and create a pathway into the industry, um, we will be okay as a whole industry. So um, with that being said, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, two industries, right, that historically have been around within cannabis. So one is the cultivation side, it's the growing side. And then the other side is the um, consumer, selling to the consumer, so the dispensary side. And again, we know that those are not the only businesses around. So what would entry into this market look like? And Cesar actually mentioned a few um, tech and IT services are a way to enter this market. Um, security services, um, whether it's the manufacturing and, and creating a safety and protection piece around that or within the dispensaries, um, cameras, et cetera, labs. We know that our folks in the legacy market are um, testing, right, um, our cannabis plants. So um, creating a cohort around lab testing sites um, as the conversation around banking and around the safety, uh, the Safety Bank Act continues to push through, we know that money, right, um, and, and knowing that our, our industry is cash heavy, um, we're going to need folks that are able to crunch numbers um, and support banking as a system in itself. So there's many ways. Um, agriculture is going to be huge as well. We know that our valley is a multi-billion dollar ag industry. Um, so, you know, our small mom and pop farmers can enter in, in, in the growing aspect of it. So with that being said, um, we can move on to the next slide there. So the workforce development, um, this is Gadji. Oh, no. Appreciate it, Seth, Bob. So what let's yeah let's hop into the workforce development sector of this so Sasad and I come from the understanding of Christine as well that um and we see the numbers right that are skewed um 80 percent white owned multi-million dollar industry um and with that being said we believe that we should focus on equally if not more than entrepreneurship and ownership the idea of workforce development um <clears throat> we know that there'll be jobs readily available. Um, so we, we believe establishing a cannabis-centered workforce development program locally here within the industry, while it's still emerging, um, will create a, a structured, secure pathway to well-paying jobs and safe jobs in our local industry. And if I can have the uh, slide pulled up. Craig, can we have the uh, slide pulled up? <clears throat> yeah. There we go. There we go. So some of the options, um, build, building a cohort of companies owned by formerly incarcerated and system impacted communities um, to run successful cannabis, in, uh, cannabis industries. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but some of the ones that um, are important. Um, we believe building a strong people-driven union process with the uh, cannabis industry is also a key. Um, job training, mentorship, mentorship uh, training programs for different segments of the industry um, and to train at different levels of management and leadership positions within industry. Um, and, and I'm going to throw this out there, but, um, you know, as you all listen to us walk through these, uh, through this presentation, share this model um, and we'll, we'll talk about how you can connect with us to share the model as well towards the end here. Next slide, please, Craig. And with that being said, so I'm going to introduce Sesad into the next slide. So, reimagining and reinvesting the cannabis tax dollar into our community. So, this is the fun part, right? Okay, so let's get into it. So, reimagining and reinvesting cannabis in tax dollars. 
right, in communities. What does that look like? What that is? So what we're saying is, as we are hearing conversations about defunding the police and putting it into community, well, this is pretty much the same thing in different, in different, in different, um, uh, in different ways, obviously. But what we mean is, right, we don't need more policing to provide safety for our communities. So in saying that, we have to imagine what reinvestment looks like, right? We know that this, this cannabis industry is going to be huge. We're talking in the billions. So how is it going to, to, to affect and impact and improve the lives of communities that have been impacted? So for example, right, expanding access opportunity for the formerly incarcerated, providing full entry support services to those returning, including access to healthcare, housing, education, employment, business ownership right and how those different pathways will work to prosperity so ensuring licensing on all levels goes to um applicants that come from the background of being impacted by the war on drugs right known as formerly incarcerated people over criminalized communities which is pretty much the hood where where Gade and i do our work and and build with community providing uh, training subsidized fees access to capital for over criminalized communities to own in the industry. Feel what I'm saying? Ensure equity licensees are able to join the industry at the same time as everyone else, so no one is given a head start to this multi-billion dollar industry. So for example, how we are seeing in other cities, pay to play, we shouldn't do that. We should, we should not do that. Um, we should be looking at really creating inclusion of our communities into this industry. And so this is some ways of how we are reimagining the cannabis tax dollars in our community by having transparency in every step of the way, meaning inclusion of communities that have been impacted every step of the way, to not just have them in mind, but have them present, and let's collectively um, work together to make the best um, for, for Fresno. So can we go to the next slide, please? And Cesar, can I slip in a question real quick yes, right yes, here? Yes, yes. Um, what are some of the what are some of the um, tools uh, maybe that um, our local electeds could employ to help our communities of color get started in this industry? I mean, no matter what anyone feels about it, it's legal here. Mm -hmm in the state and um there are resources there are tools and how do our local electeds help our people take advantage of this emerging industry beautiful question beautiful question and, and um please christine if i missed something please add in i would say for for us starting here locally in fresno for small business cannabis incub incubation program right a perfect example is when working with our local chamber of commerce to create a space that allows for prospective cannabis entrepreneurs to develop their business ideas and connect to experts and resources, business planning, financial literacy, et cetera. They need, or we need, to move to scale, ease the cost of beginning a startup, and foster innovations in the cannabis industry. And there is no one better, I feel, in our city that has most importantly than anything else the accountability and the relationship with our communities so the fresno metro black chamber of commerce is one example of creating this nurturing of our of our communities and i think that's one way to start another one is to ensure that there is access to capital for small startups to successfully launch and sustain themselves we as a as a as a business but also please keep in mind that we're also organizers and our approach since the beginning has always been community first. Well, we're not just looking at ourselves to get into this industry, we're looking at it, how do we collectively move? So there's no hate if somebody else gets licensed and we don't, we feel that we should be licensed because we have the best approach and practice, but we're also very, very candid and very open and transparent in giving information, making sure that we're coming at it just collectively and so I it's putting the pressure on the on the elected officials, um, Ms. Tara, to make sure that they do the right thing. And the way that we make sure that they do the right thing is by working together collectively with those like-minded and with those that want to um, create um, or continue to create change in our communities. Um, mentorship That's programs, the last thing I'll say, then I'll pass it on to Christine, she wants to add anything. Local mentorship programs should be prioritizing 
providing training to these individuals coming out of the legacy market and to participants from communities of color especially. We should also be promoting and use existing pathways and skill assessments that allow participants to gain credit for the abilities and experiences they already possess. We have a lot of intelligence in our communities that we have yet to figure out how do we tap into that. And I think this is a great opportunity to allow for us to tap into that. Christine, would you like to add anything? I would. I would like to add that one of the things that I think Fresno as a city needs to start moving towards quickly, especially if they're planning to give out any kind of licensing or even just the application this year, is that last year the state of California made available $30 million and cities had to apply for that $30 million and it was for technical assistance. Mm -hmm. And then you had an existing uh, cannabis industry in your city, you were able to apply for that. And then you worked with your community members, the cities did, to understand that if they got part of the $30 million, which we think will be up to $60 million by next year, then you could get money from the state that was coming from the taxes, right, into your city to be able to put together programs, technical assistance, um, grant money, for your cannabis industry. So this is one thing that Fresno missed out on last year. Um, a lot of cities, not just Fresno, but anybody who didn't have an existing cannabis industry. And so one of the things for Fresno to really understand is that there are actual dollars that are being set aside for the cities to do some of the work, not all of the work. Some of it will be from the state, some of it will be from the city, some of it will be from private donors to actually do the work to make sure that the cannabis industry in their city is inclusive and so as you start to look through when cannabis will become legal in the in the in the city of fresno you also have to be aware about when you can apply for these monies for your city so i know that um san francisco uh got three million dollars of the 30 million i think la got seven million dollars of the 30 million and so what would be impressive to me in terms of like utilizing the state is for some like a group like this group um, to be able to work with a city to say this is the kind of technical assistance that we can provide in conjunction with this dispensary or these this company or whatever to provide technical assistance for people that are coming into the industry from these black and brown communities and that's a very powerful place to start to make sure that your majority of your cannabis industry is from fresno and not other outside and not that outside you know companies are bad. I'm not saying that, but you really want about 60 to 70 percent of your cannabis industry to be in your city because then money's being spent in your city as opposed to being spent outside of your city. And so when we're thinking about the cannabis industry, it's more than just a dispensary. It's more than a cultivator. It's more than an HVAC system. It really is this government money that is actually money that your city put into it because it's the taxes that your consumers in Fresno paid at these dispensaries. So it is actually your money. And a lot of people missed out on that money last year because they didn't, the cities didn't know that they had to apply for them. That's right. Excellent That's call out, Christine. Um, I want to definitely give you your props for calling out the money that is available, one. And then two, um, the need for um, the folks that are starting in this industry to be local. Um, because we, we spend a lot of time in our economy talking about jobs. And yet there are a lot of policy decisions made and funding decisions made that um, affect that and reduce the availability of jobs in our local community. So what I'm hearing you say is that this funding and this opportunity, if it's taken advantage of, then we can have local businesses and local jobs. That's right. And also, the technical assistance, so all the stuff that Sasad and Gede were talking about, about creating these cohorts of businesses and doing all that stuff, you'd be able to utilize the technical assistance money to be able to make sure that you created that. So that if you had somebody in the informal economy right now in Fresno, and we do a lot of work with informal economy entrepreneurs to bring them into the formal economy, you would be able to like maybe put together a Fresno-based accelerator, like TPD is about to release an accelerator for New York, where we're able to take people in the traditional market and move them through the accelerator so they know everything that they need to do in order to get to the formal market. And that's something that 
you can absolutely do in Fresno. You can absolutely get technical assistance money to make sure that that's happening. Because the thing that you don't want to do is you do not want to create an industry that is really hard for people in the traditional market to transition to. So that basically you're going to be reincarcerating people because they can't or don't know how to get to the formal economy. So we do not want to create a new prison, you know, cannabis to prison pipeline because we don't have the, they don't have the knowledge. And so that's really important for communities to do, in my opinion, um, right now, so that there's not a reincarceration of the people. That's the, that's the tricky thing where we're in the legal market. If you're in the legal market, but in your, I mean, if you're in the traditional market and you don't know how to get to the legal market, so you stay in the traditional market, which is what G'day said at the top, right? Um, that $7 billion out of $8 billion is still being spent in the informal market. Um, you want to make sure that you don't do that in your city. You want to make sure that you're helping the people in the traditional market move into the formal market so that you don't reincarcerate them because they can't, they don't know how to do that. And I think this is critical for um, black communities and people of color communities that we get on this right now because we failed that in Oakland, we failed that in LA, and we failed that in San Francisco. Yeah. Fresno is the next biggest city. I think it's the fourth biggest city in California. Y'all have an opportunity to not make those same mistakes. And and they and they we just didn't know any better, but now we do. So, yeah, I think those are excellent callouts, and we are the fifth largest city in the state of California. So, um, yeah, it's very very important for us to do. Um, do you guys want to take another poll question? See what our audience. We got eighty three percent of the vote um, in that last one. Shall we hit one more poll question just to see what our audience is thinking before we go on to the next slide? Yeah, please. Sure. We would like to um, get through it and then hopefully have some questions from the audience as well if there's any questions out there. Excellent. So if our uh, attendees could vote really quickly, let us know how do you see yourself fitting into this new industry? And we've got four choices, four options for you right there. And this is a, an anonymous poll. Um, we're just trying to really get an idea of what the issues are and um, what people are thinking about, where their areas of expertise are, um, just a general um, quick pulse on on the industry. So if Ms. you Sarah, can if I, cast if your I can hop in. Yes, please do. So for the audience, um, I wanna put out there, so what we're talking about in terms of the social equity program at the state level, the bill itself is called SB 1294. Um, so go and check that out. And you said equity bill 1294? Yes, this is oh. where I was referring to the, the, the actual um, financial capital that cities can get if they have a social equity program in their, in, as part of their regulations. Am I correct in saying that, Christine? Say that one more time for me. Um, my understanding of SB 1294 is money that's given to cities that have a social equity component to their regulations in their city. Right. Yeah. And that's why it's so important that Fresno actually have one, whatever that looks like. I mean, I know they, I, I don't know if the 10% that they're planning to do, Sasad and you and Gade will know more than I since we worked on that, um, if that would be considered a social equity component. Yes, and I think this is yeah. a great segue to the next uh, slide, so perfect. Hopefully y'all brothers and sisters answered the, that poll question because that's very important. We need that information. Um, can we go to the okay so next slide Craig oh yeah we can we can we can tap into this real quick just to give an explanation to 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 the um to the family listening out there so um again right as we reimagine and reinvesting cannabis tag dollars in community what it could do so I, I want to uh, touch on this right which is the reinvestments in communities who were harmed by war on drugs so reinvesting in over criminalized communities is what we have in our city, this thing called the Community Benefit Fund. That's what we have locally here in our city. So 90% of the taxation locally here is gonna go to a general fund, money to be used for homelessness, 
um, could they help me out? Homelessness, ho um, housing, which is um, human uh, trafficking. homelessness and human trafficking, right? Um, housing, that's where that comes from. Safety, parks, and um, roads, right? So this is what the 90% is going to be used from the taxation, and the 10% is this community benefit fund that still needs to be, um, and this is what reimagining, right, how we invest back in our community is all about, is putting us, a community, in position, not just of power, but direction on how this money should be used and what should it be used for. And so it's going to be very critical for your audiences out there to really tune in to what's going on and please help advocate, not just for yourself, but for those communities that have been harmed by the war on drugs. Um, especially with the conversations going around the city about what it is to reform the police department or to defund the police department, what that will look like. Well, this plays a big role because we shouldn't be having money go to more policing, but that's going to be going to the cannabis industry. It should be for us reimagining and reinvesting cannabis tax dollars to improve community. So safety can be a, a different thing that does not require more police presence in our communities. So I think that we have to, and I and I, I really, really push all of us to really think critical on what that safety is. Safety is housing. Safety is having access to, to facilities in the parks. That is safety. So when we look at the taxation of this, of this cannabis money, we should be looking at it from a lens of what is safety for our communities without police presence. And so um, that's the main thing that I wanted to hit with these. And some of these um, um, uh, words here are very uh, self-explanatory, so I, I won't go into it. We can go to the next slide so we can get um, some of the brothers and sisters questions. So, get there. You want to you take this? Yes, sir. Thank you, C. Um, so, what would cost look like? Um, I think that's one question that we consistently get. What, what, what would it look like to enter this industry and how much does it cost? Um, and for the sake of time, I want to kind of hit a couple of points. So in general, the licensing application itself, and this, these in our estimates are right around $5,000. Um, real estate would be right about $100,000, not including $50,000 in estimates of, of um, business equipment, um, which is going to be huge, is right, again, an estimate, $25,000, security and surveillance, $50,000. Um, and if we rack up all these as and give you a ballpark figure, you're looking at at, at a startup cost at about $500,000 to $750,000. Um, and again, there's a bullet point there, you know, depending on what state you're in, some states don't require you to have assets at all. Um, an example is like Pennsylvania. One of the stipulations there is you have to have 200000 I'm sorry, 2 million in assets at, and at least 500,000 in liquid cash. So we're talking about money and significant change in money. Mm -hmm. Craig, so can we go to C to get into the, to the engine is very expensive. So the average cost for the first year is we're looking, and this is estimates, right? This is estimates. So 50,000 in legal fees, insurance, Right, you can read it right there. Um, you please, please, please get in contact with us. Um, we 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 are a social enterprise business model that has its heart more than anything in the community because we are from the community. So we're blessed that Christine believed in Gede and myself to be in good alignment with the mission and vision of the People's Dispensary as a national um, company and with the opportunity to allow us to do what we do without being managed in any form to make sure that we're doing right for our community because we are in this community and we are from the community. And so um, you, these are some of the costs to start up. We'll love to continue to, to, to build and, and partner with brothers and sisters out there that are like-minded. Um, and then, you know, we continue to rock uh, solid and, and make sure that we have the best um, for our city of Fresno. Um, we can go into the next slides. Right. Did you want to add anything, or, or Christine, would you guys like to add anything? Nope, I'm good. Thank you. Same here. We we can go to the next slide. So 
how do you stay connected with us? You can follow us on IG um, at mytpd.fre for Fresno and at mytpd.com. Um, you can shoot us an email at hello at mytpd.com. Um, and with that being said, we'd love to hear from the audience um, questions, thoughts, concerns with the next 10 minutes or so that we have left here. Excellent. While our audience gets their um, questions together, I think we have one more polling question uh, for them. Um, so Craig, if you want to throw up that polling question um, so that uh, we can find a little bit more about them uh, while we um, get those questions together. So please, um, if you have a question that you've thought of, if anything here has spurred your your thoughts about getting into this industry. Um, as our guests have said, there are many different um, entry points and ways to support the industry without having to touch the flower itself. Um, more opportunities other than cultivating. Um, there are edibles. There are all kinds of ways that you can enter this. And um, I'd like to know um, what percentage and and Gade, Cesar, Christine, whichever one of you guys um, are are able to, if you could answer, what percentage of the market? Um, is medicinal and what percentage of the market is recreational um i know it's legal both are legal but i'm 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 hearing that in different places there are different um regulations regarding recreational and medicinal can can you shed a little bit of light on that for me i'm gonna say if you don't mind me hopping in here society good day no oh, please go ahead I'm gonna say that for me, my opinion around cannabis is 100% of it is medicinal. But because they've split it up, um, what we see in the stores that we have is about 80% of the people that come into the store buy recreational um, mm -hmm. and 20% buy under medicinal. And why that's important is because in, the, in California and in Oregon, if you are a medicinal patient, you don't pay taxes. And so in California specifically, where the taxes can be as high as 40%, that is a huge savings of your medicinal. Um, and where in, in Oregon, it will be 20% that you're saving on the taxes. And so that makes it good. But this idea, I think that we're going to see, I, I think we'll see in about 10 years, that there's not going to be a difference between recreational and med medicinal. Because even people that come in to buy recreational cannabis, they're usually treating something. And this is what I always tell folks. There is such a healing property from our ancestors that comes with the cannabis plant. And as we start to learn more about what CBA, CBG, CBD, CBN can do, we're going to start to see it really being able to be grown specifically for this illness. And so even though it will make you feel good, it might be a sativa, it makes you feel really creative and energetic, I just always have believed, and this has been found out just in my anecdotal evidence, that everybody's treating something, even if they don't know it. And I've had young people come into the store and they're like, you know, Mr. <laughs> People call me Miss Chris and they'd be like, you know, what's the highest THC you've got in the store? And those are usually shatters or waxes. And I'll say to them, this has 74% THC and I'm going to sell it to you. It costs 95 bucks. I said, but I want you to come back and tell me why you need to be, why you need it to be so high. I go explain to me, think about why do you need 74% THC? Okay. And most of them have come back and said, well, it's usually something like I'm depressed. My best friend got shot. Um, I have anxiety. I have social anxiety. And so when they start to really, when people, when you ask the question about what they need it for in a way that's not confrontational or judgmental, they will think about it and come back to you and say, I need it for this. And then you're able as a dispensary owner to really talk to them about what they actually need. Because most people don't actually need 74% THC. And sometimes they're buying the wrong type of ca cannabis or might be buying a sativa if they suffer from anxiety that's absolutely the wrong thing to buy you want to buy an indica and i'm usually right. able to get them to buy another product 
um, that's cheaper, but that will actually help what they're actually treating. So I always believe every all cannabis is medical cannabis. And this is G'day and, and Christine, thank you, thank you. Because one of the things that I experience with folks like Baby is absolutely what Christine's saying from the mental health end is we are trying to treat some sort of pain. And it, it could be social, it could be emotional, it could be economic, but it is pain. Um, and and guess, one of, guess what cannabis is that initial entry point for folks. Um, and then it gets trickier to try to manage pain. Um, and there's some really neat, neat research going on now in the mental health field where um, our, our old school elder therapists are going back to cannabis um, and really re-experimenting, microdosing with clients. Um, so 100% in alignment with, with Christine, it's, there's some sort of pain that's being treated. And, and when you sit with folks and listen to that, you get exactly that. So that's very helpful. Thank you, Christine. Excellent. Um, so we've got a question from um, our audience. How many stores will Fresno allow and how can we assure minority people a percentage of those stores that are going to be allowed in Fresno? Excellent question. Um, let me take this one and you fill in, brother, or you want to take it? Sure. Okay, okay, so the city has said there's going to open up seven dispensaries the first year. Out of those seven, only one is going to be a social equity. There's going to be a total of, could they correct me if I'm wrong, there's going to be a total of 28 dispensaries in the city. Out of those 28, only four are going to be equity applicants. It is a shame, it is an embarrassment that we have a, um, some people call it progressive um, city councilor in our city right now, uh, Mr. Arias, Miguel Arias, is the, the chair of the of the AHA committee for the cannabis in our city. He and the city mayor's office agreed to this. I would I would advise you to get in contact with Jennifer Ruiz, who is from the city manager's office, um, that is looking at the process of the the the, the cannabis. And just advocate like we've been advocating, um, brother and sister, whoever made the question. But all we know is that through advocacy and being transparent and being in community and being about community on, on a real way, not just talking, but just talking, let me get in and then I'm going to help community out. F that. We're, let's get in this collectively together. That's That's been our, our motto. That's been our motto, collective. And if you want to rock with us, you rock with us. If you don't, cool, we work in parallel. And when we need to be intersectional, we get down and, and we link up. But the most important thing I would say is that is the answer to the question. And in order to make sure that we have better representation of these um, uh, businesses locally, then we have to advocate and not be afraid to advocate at the risk of being dismissed, of being um, not you know, taken uh, seriously. And this is something that we have to change. And the only way that we change it is by collective, you know, building um, the narrative that we want representation of, of, of our folks in the industry. And in Fresno, I will tell you for the remaining people that are on the call, in Fresno, you should be demanding that 80% and not right. going below 50%. Right. 50% of those 28 licenses should go to people of color, black people, people who've been formerly incarcerated. They should be, there should be 14 social equity licenses. I mean, if you look at LA, they just did this huge sweeping change and every license that they're going to give out in LA has to be social equity. There's not a single one that's going to go to somebody who doesn't have social equity partner, an actual person in their store. So I would tell you, Fresno, to get out there and really start to advocate for that. Otherwise, you're going to, the, your communities will lose so much money um, if you don't do that. One thing that I want to be clear, there is a lot of confusion on what social equity is. Our city has in the policy and this is how they think they're gonna get they get away with it, right? Each business that's going for a dispensary license has to have a social equity program um, to be um, taken seriously, right? As a licensee, but that could be many things. Another another part of it, what they've done in LA was organize and have better narrative of what 
that what that would look like. And so that's something that we've been advocating here locally. And we hope that if you want to get in contact with us and, and, and see where we are with that conversation, please, please do. So we can um, continue to build more um, collective participation and inclusion on, on how the city is moving along with, with, uh, with the process. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, good day. I'm going to give you the last word because uh, it is time for us to wrap. We're at 12 o'clock, and so we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Sure. Closing thought from you. We, we are past this being a moral argument in terms of the industry, its revenue. And we are at a point where we need to advocate to have our place, right? We've consistently talked and said that to have our place that rightfully so is deserved. Um, the numbers speak, right, to where legalization is struggling versus where the legacy underground market is flourishing. Um, I would also say get a hold of your city officials. Um, Jennifer Ruiz, is now in and says how to mention this now currently on um, the cannabis commissioner project. so getting hold of project manager commissioner get a hold of her office um we have a very loose board and commission board with um that's responsible for overseeing this whole process at the moment so council member arias councilwoman um soria are um part of the decision making process get a hold of them um, and more importantly, find out exactly who your council member is um, and speak, right? And you can get a hold of us, right, via email. So get at us at, at hello um, dot mytpd dot com, and um, we will filter messages and we will get back to you and get a hold of us on our um, Instagram page as well, right? So at mytpd dot fre. Excellent. Well, I definitely want to thank you all for being here today for this very important discussion and opportunity for our community. And it is my hope that everyone who attended today that they were engaged and they left very educated on this topic. Um, remember each and every one of you have the power to invest in yourself and your community. And one very easy way that you can do that is by completing the 2020 census for your household. You can complete it online at my2020census.gov or you can do it by phone at 844-330-2020. The census count determines funding for our communities, programs like ours and programs like we just heard about. So please reach out to us if you have any questions or um, need help on your small business, we provide 10 hours of technical assistance each year for our members. It is included in their membership. You can give us a call at 559-441-7929 or drop us an email, info at fmbcc.com. I do want to thank you three for sharing um, the information that you shared this morning. Christine, Cesar, good day. Uh, much love to you. Um, be well, be blessed, and we will see you soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Peace. Thank you. Out. Yeah.